Hopefully, Hopefully it all works out. I decided to add a title page this week. Does anyone know, know the, last the last time you used, used a microphone, microphone does, it does it have playback? playback? Is that, Is that a normal, normal thing? thing? The password today is five two two three four zero. Oh, okay. Now the problem is solved. I was being an idiot. I had my mic turned on on my laptop as well. Yes, that is so great. Whew, it was driving me crazy, honestly. Okay, it's because I had two mics on. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> hmm. Okay, I'm gonna start the quiz. Remember that you can join midway through but I want to get on to today's content as well. You want to preserve the value of a variable across page postbacks, but only need it for the current page. Which form of state management is required? This one's actually pretty tough, I think. Okay, not as tough as I thought, apparently. Uh, well done, guys. Yeah, so it is the view state. I, I won't talk about the others yet because they might come up in questions later, but um, I'll try to remember to discuss them uh, later. But yeah, the view state is where we would store variables relating to the current page, and they are stored across page postbacks. I'm going to show you this practically today in an actual web application, um, so you'll, you'll see it in action. Uh, all right, you have to hit enter now, weird. You are storing the number of users currently engaged with particular pages on your site. Which form of state management is appropriate?
Okay, nice. That one was closer. Interesting. Yeah, I did. I did word it a little bit weirdly. I imagine if I asked you the number of users currently on the site, you guys all would have said application state. Um, but in this case, perhaps it's slightly more difficult. But still, still not too bad, I don't think. Um, again, I won't discuss the other two. Glad no one said view state since we did just see that one. Um, but yeah, nicely done still. Uh, majority still got it correct, so that's cool. You want to perform some post-processing after a, page, a page request has been handled completely. Which event handler in the page lifecycle should you use? So after the request has been handled, we want to do some post-processing. So we want to do some stuff afterwards. Oof, big split. Interesting. Okay, I mean, we can discuss a little, a little bit about each one. So init is where objects for each control are created. Pre-render. Ooh, by the way, I don't know who it is. Let me just check. I, Andrew, we can hear you, hey? Just the warning. Um, so pre-render is at the final warning before the page is rendered to be back to the rendered. Um, and just prepared to be sent back to the user. Render is when the page is rendered, so like it's finalized. Um, load is where controls are loaded to the screen. And yeah, unload occurs after everything's done. So after the request has been completely handled, the unload event is called. Okay. That was a tough one though. In a way, it's it's good though that what you guys were struggling with is the um, page event thing, the life cycle, because we'll see a bit more of that today. The user must be able to view their personal data on every page of your web application in a secure way. Which form of state management is ideal? Sorry, I'm late, sir. All good, all good. Okay, good split. I'm glad. So everyone either answered session or cookie, which is, is, is not a bad thing. Um, in this, remember that when we are talking about these questions, we're talking from the perspective of developers. Okay, so when we see a cookie on the server, it is not called a cookie, it's called a session. I remember we did discuss this distinction quite a lot um, last week, but, but I, I expected some of you, the first time you see this kind of wording, it w it's okay to think cookie. And in fact, the first time I saw these kinds of questions in the MT MTA, I thought cookie. But remember, cookie is what the user calls it in their browser. What we call it on the server is a session, right? And since we're talking about developing here, we're talking about what you should use on your web application, right? Your web application, that's, that's a session, okay? Cool, um, but yeah, I, I'm still happy with how this was answered. Um, application state, so remember that application state will never store user-specific information. It stores information specific to the entire application. 
Okay, so like maybe if you're having a 30% site-wide sale on all of the products on your app, then you might store that in the application state, or you might store the number of currently active users on your website in the application state, that kind of thing. Query strings are not secure. Okay, query strings are not secure. Because you can read them, right? You can read them and edit them how you like. You want to make changes to page properties before the controls are initialized, which event handler in the page lifecycle is appropriate. So before the controls that are going onto the page are initialized, we want to make some changes to some basic page properties. Where would we do that? This one's hopefully not too bad, but we'll see. These, these page lifecycle questions, the first time you see them can be quite tough. Okay, most people got it, that's, that's cool. So pre-render is the final warning before the page is rendered, which means that by that point, all of everything should be handled, especially like the controls will definitely be initialized um, by that final warning. Init is where the controls are initialized. So the page properties are already set, okay. Um, but yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll see a little bit more about this today, um, but, but in general, nicely done, guys. Last week's lecture content, I think, was quite difficult, and I'm pretty glad with how you guys seem to handle it in this quiz. Um, well done to the first emotes and Mango. Yo, you two were very close there, hey? Nice, nice. Four right, that's pretty good. Very good, actually. Cool. Good game. Now on with the lecture content. So today's lecture is on web services. I also want to show you some practical examples of the stuff we learned last week. Because load shedding is going to start and I am currently talking to you guys from my desktop, which will obviously be off during load shedding. I'm going to show you the practical stuff first. So the practical stuff I'm doing is it's freely available to you guys. The community 2019 edition of Visual Studio. I do recommend you install it. You don't have to install it today. You can just um, follow through with what I'm doing. But before next week's lecture, um, and especially before the lecture after next week's lecture, please have Visual Studio Community Edition installed. If you are not on a Windows machine, that's why I'm using my desktop because my laptop is um, on Linux. Um, if you're not on a Windows machine, uh, don't worry about it, okay? Don't worry about it. It's not, a, not the end of the world. Uh, oh, nicely done, Alex. Um, and cool, yeah, well done, guys. So, um, yeah, don't, don't worry about it if you're not on a Windows machine. Uh, remember that what we're here to learn, I'm trying to keep things, keep trying to keep things general. All right, trying to keep things general so that you'll be able to take the knowledge elsewhere rather than just becoming a C-sharp developer at Microsoft or something. Not that that's a bad thing. That's, I, I hear Microsoft pay, pays quite well. Anyway, I'm rambling and we don't have much time. So we're gonna, the flow is gonna be a little bit weird today. We're gonna be learning about the practical stuff. So I'm going to show you a web service before I teach you about web services. Okay, just, just to account for load shedding, turning off the desktop. But before we do that, I'm gonna give you one sort of simple example um, of the page lifecycle, like in practice. Um, what, what it actually looks like in code, because I think that'll kind of cement your understanding a little bit. And then we'll move on with all of this web services stuff. So I'm, I've opened up Visual Studio. This is sort of just what it looks like. Visual Studio is very nice, guys, by the way. If you're looking for a place to program that's not Notepad, um, Visual Studio is definitely a good place to start. It's free as well. Okay, you can install all of this stuff. I, I, I suppose I should have shown you that. I, I'll show you at the end of the lecture, actually on my laptop. Um, so you can select anything that you want to develop. I just installed the ASP.NET web framework or like the .NET framework on, on my computer. Um, and somewhere here, you would be able to find ASP.NET web application .NET framework for C-sharp. There's also a Visual Basic one, which is like 
slight, everything slightly different, but very similar, which is very disconcerting if you're not expecting to be doing things in Visual Basic. So make sure you select the C-sharp one because um, that'll be exactly what you guys know. Um, you can just select that one that you want to create a project of that. Um, you can select somewhere to save it. I'm just going to... I'm just going to save everything to my desktop. Uh, load. This computer is absolute chaos. I need to take some time and like format it or something. Um, cool. So I'm going to call the project web application one. Yeah, that's fine. I'll call the, th the solution lesson four, something like that. And Cool, I'll create this. And we're gonna go with a totally empty web application. You can see like it can automatically generate unit tests for you guys. Um, if you click also create unit tests um, and it can do a bunch of other things. It's, it's like very useful uh, developing with this because it means you don't have to set up everything yourself. So you'll see it'll automatically set up like the body of the c -sharp programs and of the HTML documents and all of that nonsense. So you don't have to do it yourself. So it's creating project. This is the one problem with it. It is super slow and this computer is very old. I think I've had it for like 13 years or something. So it will take a little while. Okay, wasn't expecting it to take this long. To be fair, it is creating a lot of files though. So. <laughs> And I did want to show you the whole process rather than just coding up the, the example. Oh, uh, but while, while we're waiting for uh, Visual, um, Visual Studio to load up this project, what we're, the example we're doing is on page 98. Okay, it's on page 98. Okay, did Visual Studio just decide to exit? I guess that's fine too. Okay, there we go. Awesome. Trust me, it is very nice, particularly if you have a computer that's fast enough to, to run it. Um, okay, cool. So the project's generated. So ninth, page 98 of your textbook, I'll be doing something fairly similar to that and just pointing out the important parts of it that can come up in tests. Okay, so cool. We've generated a web application. You can see it created like a whole bunch of stuff for us so that we didn't have to do it ourselves, which is fantastic because actually doing this stuff yourself and making sure that the directories are properly created is a huge nightmare. I'm then just going to say add add new item and we're gonna hit web form yeah web form there we go and that's going to create some more files and stuff for us eventually or it's just going to break okay cool it, it worked <laughs> that's good and yeah so what it creates for us you can see this you guys recognize this hopefully right this is just a HTML documents. It looks a little bit weird, but you can see they've got the HTML tag, they've got the head tag, they've got the body tag, and they've got a form here, uh, which is just like a place that we can write stuff and you can do a bunch of things with. Okay. Um, um, but yeah, the, the nice thing is that it automatically generated this for us, so, so that's great. And what it also created was this, ASP, this ASP.NET CS document. So this is CS code that is linked to the web form that we have here. Okay. Um, I, I know it's called .aspx. It is just an HTML document, basically. It's just an, it's an HTML document that can communicate with the .NET framework. Okay, so it's just marking it as like intelligible to C-sharp, basically. And you can see that it points to the code that we're writing here. So webform1.aspx.cs is just this file. And nothing, happen nothing fancy is happening here, guys. Okay, this is literally just a, the namespace is web application one. You know what that is. It's a class, it's inheriting, right? You know what this colon means. It's inheriting from system.web.ui.page. So it's a page, okay? This is just a page. Um, and so it inherits from the page, uh, page class. And here we've got a method pointing to page underscore load, page underscore load. What this is doing is linking to the load event um, of the application of the page lifecycle. Okay. Um, anyway, so let me just, I'll have to constantly check the chat. I should open it up. There we go. 
All right, so let's let's actually um, program in some some examples here. The first thing I want to point out to you guys, and they like asking it, they even point it out in the textbook, is this auto event wire up equals true. So all this is is a boolean. Okay, it's a boolean variable that's just telling C sharp whether you want to be able to refer to events by their name. Okay, so page underscore load. Load is the name of the event. The only way C sharp can understand that you're referring to the event here. Is, is, is if you set auto event wire up equals true. If not, then you can use the word load without referring to the event. But in this case, we are referring to the event because auto event wire up equals true, okay? So if you're asked like something is broken, um, why something is broken when I try to have referenced the load event, um, it's saying that it can't find the name, what, why is that? Uh, you'll say, oh, it's because auto event wire up isn't set to true. So that's the first thing I wanna, we want to learn here. And now we just want to create some things that will occur when events happen. Um, so response is also just an object defined here. Okay, response um, is, is an object that's defined. And it is just referring to the page that you are sending back to the user. So like this ASP.NET page is coming to you. You can make some edits to it like using basically a, a version of console.writeLine. And, but all of those will occur on the response object, okay? So you could say like response.write, for example. You see it auto-completes. There's a lot of other things you can do with response, okay? But write is just one of them. And this is very similar to console.write. This is just gonna write to the page, all right? It's just gonna write to the page. So I'm gonna say, um, hello from load event. And then I'm gonna put the HTML break tag at the end of this so that it creates a new line. So it's basically like using console.write line. So it's creating a new line at the end. Okay. And it's super easy to create link things to other events. The main thing we wanna see here is the order of the events and exactly like how this, how to link. So let's say I wanna, if you go to the previous page in your textbook, so page 97, you can see the names of the events on the right there. Right, there's pre-init, init, load, pre-render, and unload. You can link to any of those events. So load is where C sharp, behind what we're seeing here, it will do it automatically. It's gonna load all of the controls onto the page. At that stage, it's also gonna print out this message. But let's say I wanna print out a message at the pre-init stage. Okay, let's say I wanna print out a message at the pre-init stage. All I have to do to do that is the exact same structure. So protected, you guys know what that means. That means that it's only accessible inside web form one when anything, when any class that inherits from web form one. Void, that means the method doesn't return anything. So I'm not gonna be using the return statements. Then I give it the name, page underscore pre-init. Okay, pre-init is the name of the event that I am linking to, okay? And these events, the, de the delegate defined for these events, say that they take in a sender, which is um, like the object holding the person that sent the request, and event args, okay, which is just like some extra arguments that the event can pass. Um, I'm, I don't think you'd ever use these much. And then, okay, but you might say like, what's special about this? This is just the name of the method. And that's a good intuition if you're, if you're thinking something along that. Like this is just page underscore pre init is just the name of the method. How is it linking to the event without doing that plus equals thing? You guys remember the plus equals thing to like add to, a, add to an event list. You would have to do that plus equals thing if this, if auto event wire up, auto event wire up was not set to true, you would have to do the plus equals thing. Okay, that's why we set auto event wire up to true. That's the problem it solves. Um, let me speed up a little bit. So then I can also just print out. Okay, so I'm just gonna write to the page and you guys will see what this does afterwards. So I'm gonna say hello from page in it. Pre in it, sorry. Okay. Now, again, I could do more examples here and you can see in your book, you can link to init by saying page underscore init. You can link to pre-render by saying page underscore pre-render. And I'm sure you guys get the idea. I think these two examples are probably enough. So cool, we've, we've written up these, these methods. What we'll now do is build the application to make sure there's no errors. 
So um, it's just going to go ahead and build. It says build started. It's running some stuff. It's going to take a little while because there's a lot going on. Okay, so it's building, it's building. Okay, and now that that's done, so you see it said build one succeeded, so there was no errors. I'm now gonna say, uh, I'm gonna come here and I'll say view in browser. And it's gonna open up in Microsoft Edge because you know Microsoft made all of this stuff. So fair enough, right? Okay, and it opens up localhost slash webform1.aspx, which is cool. And it's loading, it's loading, it's loading. And look what it did. So it printed out hello from pre-init and then hello from load event. Okay, so what's interesting here? Number one, you can see that the method pre-init is written after the page load events inside the class. But you can see that in the, in the document, it says hello from pre-init first. Why is that? Well, quite clearly because the pre-init event occurs before the load event, right? So you can see the order from this example, and you can also see how to link to events. The important thing, you guys know, this is just the name of the method. How is this linking to the event? How is this linking to the event handler? Because ASP.NET was nice, and if you set auto event wire up to true, it's automatically going to evaluate this method as being a part of the event handler for the load event, okay? The, the method invocation list. So hopefully, I know it does look a little weird and it, and it is. And like until you program more with ASP.NET, it, it will continue to look weird. Um, but hopefully you, you, can, you have some intuition about what this is all referring to, right? You know what inheritance is. Um, you know what these are. They're just methods. You know now why these methods are automatically linked to the events because auto event wire up is set to true. And you know what order they are called in. Okay, so, so that's some intuition about that. There's one nice thing that's not shown in the book, and I'm not sure why they didn't, um, but I'll just show it to you quickly because uh, I, I don't know why I'm being generous with our time because it's not really, we do need to be quick actually. So protected void page underscore. There's one event um, that they don't link to in the example of page 98. Can you guys tell me which one actually, just to get some class interaction going. On page 98 of the book, they link to a whole bunch of events, right? We can see protected void page underscore load, protected void page underscore init. Yeah, Adam, you're right. They didn't link to unload. Now, why didn't they do that? Let's, let's actually see why. So you can see in every single event that they link to in the textbook, they use this term response.write, response.write. So I'm gonna link to the unload events. Okay, I'm gonna say, Object sender, I'm gonna do, do it the exact same way as I did everything else, okay? And then I'm gonna say response.write and I'll say unload, okay? So I'll say hello from unload. Does anyone have some intuition about why they didn't do this in the example? Why, why do you think they wouldn't do this? What does the unload event do? When is it called? From the quiz, when, when is the unload event called? Or when is the unload event raised, I should say rather. When is the unload event raised? Okay, I'll discuss it after the page is loaded, exactly. So yeah, like Christian said, the unload event is raised after this page has already been sent back to the user, right? But all response.write does is write to the page. So you'll see that when I try to run this, response is not actually available. So I'm gonna build this. I forget, it, it might be able to build. Okay, it did build. But let me say a uh, view in browser. You see, so it gives me this error. It says response is not available in this context. Okay, because it says, Inside page under load, underscore load, you can't use response. And hopefully you guys have some intuition about why we can't use response in page underscore unload, right? Because the response has already been delivered. It's gone. The response is gone. It's, you can't edit it anymore. 
um, the last chance you had to edit it was the pre-render event. Okay, and you can see that now, um, yeah, so yeah, response not available in page underscore unload. Okay, which is quite interesting. So it, it'll show you, hopefully that just shows you guys um, that this is working how you assume it works. Okay, so yeah, that's the last thing I wanted to show you about the page lifecycle. Hopefully that cemented your guys' understanding a little bit because I know how we covered it last week was a little bit abstract. And now we are going to move on. I did actually want to do a little bit of client-side state management. Do we have time? No, okay. The primary thing I want to do is actually um, web services. Okay, that's the primary thing I want to show you guys. So I'm going to skip over to that. All right, I'm going to skip over to that. Um, the examples we'll kind of be working with, although ours might be slightly different, although I guess their example is quite nice as well. Um, you'll be able to see it on page 109. Okay, I'm going to give you guys some context, okay? I'm going to give you guys some context first. We're going to pretend that we're working at a call center. Okay, or actually, okay, let me even start with context before that. So I'm going to say one of the huge benefits of creating web applications is that um, one of the huge benefits of creating web applications is that you only need a browser to access them, right? So you can imagine without having C Sharp installed on your computer, you could access the web site, the web application that we just created here. And you can have access to this method inside C-sharp, response.write. Okay. Now, obviously, this method is very trivial. You can write to the screen in normal HTML. But there's a lot of things that C-sharp can do that HTML can't do. And so that's a huge benefit of websites, okay, is that you can give people access to really complex functionality without them having it installed on their phone. You don't need C Sharp installed on your phone in order to access the, the C Sharp through the web server, okay? So some context on that. The, the next thing I wanna set up is, let's say we're working in a call center, and this is like a super weird call center, where we, um, <laughs> it's a very weird call center, where you can phone in and ask some mathematical questions, okay? So you can phone into the call center, for example, and ask them what the factorial of five is. Now, obviously, someone's going to pick up the phone in our crazy call center. And they, the, the person picking up the phone might not necessarily know how to calculate factorials on the spot, right? They, they might not necessarily know how to do that, um, which, which I think is, is believable. So <laughs> I, I know I, I'm, it's, it's a stretch, this little example, but, but hopefully, hopefully you, we just go with it. Um, and so cool. So working, working from that example, we're going to say, oh, new project, sorry. Yeah. So, so yeah, working from that example, we're going to, what we're going to do is create a thing. So obviously at a call center, there's lots of, there's lots of people handling the phone calls and working on things, right? So not all of them can have like a super fancy computer that can run C sharp programs, right? So what we're going to do is have one central server that will be like quite expensive and everyone else is going to access that central server through, um, through the, through a browser installed on like a very basic, um, network, like uh, installed on a very basic computer. Okay. A very basic device. Um, like maybe you guys have seen some of these little devices, basically just a router that with the browser installed on it and through their browser, they're going to be able to access our central server and they're going to be able to type in a lot of these questions. Okay. This might seem like a stretch example, but actually this is very frequently done in call centers. Um, it's one of the places it's frequently done. We'll see some more examples when we start going through the, the technical aspects of it. And yeah, cool. So we'll work from that. Let me just find this because I've been scrolling now blindly. Um, so yeah, we're going to create this thing that allows you to, geez, it's, yeah, cool. 
Um, so we go, we're going to create this thing that allows our call center people to, to visit that site and run some complex C sharp code to do some complex maths. And hopefully I hinted at it, hinted at it already. Um, the maths that they're going to be doing is the, is maths for, is maths for <laughs> calculating the factorial. Okay. So we're going to have like a little recursive function, um, that they can use. All right. So hold on, let me just set this up quickly. This one I probably should have just set up before because it's a mission finding where everything is installed. Mm. Oh, wait, okay, hold on. Okay, let me see if it works this way. Sorry about this, guys. I know the, the books example I noticed is like a little bit outdated, like it's using an older version of Visual Studio. Um, but I did want to show you guys this because it's quite cool. But I need to be quick. Mm. Add new item. Where is this thing? We're looking for web service, web service, web service. Ah, there it is. Why couldn't I see it? Okay, sorry about that. Okay, cool. I find it disaster averted. Okay, cool. Now this, this is actually super easy. So that's why I, I'm, I'm okay showing it to you before you guys even know what it is. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do I'll, okay, we'll start with a simple, a simple um, method, right? That, that, we, that hopefully we can all write. So this method is just gonna take in two numbers and add them together. So you know exactly what's going on with this, okay? So we're gonna say public ints. I'm gonna remove this one actually. So we're gonna say public ints. I'm gonna call it add numbers. So it's super similar to the function that we wrote for our JavaScript web app, right? It's just gonna take in the two numbers that it's going to add, int A and int B, okay? And it's just going to return A plus B. So this is one of the questions that the people in our call center will be able to answer. Now, the only difference here, number one, notice that this class, so this is just a standard class, public class web service one. You can see that it inherits from a class called system.web.services.webservice, okay? So this is just a standard class that's inheriting from another class. It's also marked. So you can see here, it's marked as a web service, okay? It's marked as a web service. And it's linked to a particular URL. So the, the namespace is like the URL of the site, okay? Um, so hopefully this is not too bad. And the, the next thing is any method that you want to be available as a web service, and just remember this for now, you just mark as a web method, okay, a web method. That's just saying this C-sharp method is gonna be accessible through the web. And this is actually, practically speaking, all that a web service is. It's a special kind of method that's marked with the web method um, marker here, decorator it might be called. Um, so you, you can, you just mark it with that, but otherwise it's a standard C-sharp method and you'll see what this allows the method to do. So I'll leave it at that for now. I'm just gonna build the application again. So just build solution. And you can see it starts building, um, going on. Okay. I think it's warning me you shouldn't start it with the lower case, but that's fine. And then I'm just gonna right click on our web service here and I'm just gonna say view in browser. Okay, so all I did was create a very simple method and I marked it with the web method attribute. And when I say view in browser, you'll see the page it opens now. OK, 
Okay, so it opens up this page here. Now this is the kind of page, obviously you can modify it slightly. Um, you, can, you can modify this page how you like really. So obviously we'll make this look slightly nicer for our call center. Like we'll put the name of our call center here and we would remove all of this horrible stuff. Um, but you can see that the add numbers method has been, has been written here. If I click that add numbers method, I can type the numbers that I wanna add and hit invoke, okay? And you can see it responds with the solution. Again, you can format this response how you want. You can format this response how you want. Um, but in general, you, this is just a special way to format a standard C-sharp method. Okay, so all of the methods that you mark, all of the standard C-sharp methods that you mark as web methods inside a class that is marked as a web service class, you will be able to access through a browser like that. And what's the advantage of this? It means you can have a bunch of computers that have no access or no ability to run C Sharp and have them access all of the functionality of C Sharp. So for example, I can write a method called factorial that takes in an integer n. And you guys have seen this method before. And we can say if n equals equals zero, if n equals equals zero, then we're just going to return one. And otherwise, we're going to return n times by factorial of n minus one. So you guys have seen this exact method before, right? We discussed this method back in chapter one. This is just a recursive method for finding the factorial of the given integer n, right? Because it's marked as a web method inside a class marked as a web service, you'll see what this allows us to do now. Um, and I know this is, this is not the ideal order to be doing this in. Ideally, I would have explained web services first, but you know, uh, tough times. Okay, cool. So it built it. Um, the build succeeded. That's cool. I'm going to uh, open up my browser, hit refresh here. And you can see it's now added the factorial. Okay, it also moved to the left a bit. You see it now added the factorial method. So I can click that factorial method. It gives me all the parameters that I can input. So I can put five, hit invoke, and it responds with 120. Again, the response is weirdly formatted here, but you can replace this page with whatever HTML document you want. Okay, so you can get it, so that you can get it to be formatted in a nice way. All right, but in principle, all this is, is a C-sharp method just being formatted in a particular way to be accessible through browsers. And again, the benefit of this is that computers that do not understand C-sharp will be able to access this complex C-sharp functionality through the browser. Now we're doing silly maths examples here, but you can imagine much more complex logic like a switch statement telling the person at the call center how they should respond or perhaps you could set up a web service to communicate with other websites, right? Like other web or other web applications that don't have access to that C-sharp functionality. Um, and we'll see some more in detail example of how we use web services in the real world now. But I hope for now this gives you a decent, like a practical understanding of what the web services are doing. Okay, this, this is literally all they are. They are standard C-sharp methods marked as web methods. And that just means you're now able to access them through a web browser. Okay. That is essentially what these, what these are. If you guys have ever heard of the term um, application um, API, so API, application programming inf interface, um, the APIs or, or rather web services are just a special kind of API. Okay. And, but again, I'll, we'll discuss that side of the theory more um, as, we, as we move through this. Uh, the only reason we're doing things in this order is because things are a little, um, you know, because of because of load shedding, basically. Cool. The the other thing I wanted to discuss with you quickly is you can see all of this stuff um, down here, and we're not going to explain it in detail yet, but we will eventually. Um, but what I what I just want you guys to notice now is that we have this. It's called SOAP. Okay, we are going to discuss what SOAP is eventually but you can see that this is what a SOAP request looks like. We'll discuss the details of these requests again in a bit, but this is just how the request is passed from the browser to the server. Now, hopefully you guys can see this looks very similar to HTML, right? In this case, it's, it's also a markup language. So in a way it is, it is very similar to HTML. 
It's just that this isn't HTML, it's called XML, Extensible Markup Language, okay? X, the reason why we use XML to pass around web service messages is because um, XML, just like HTML, can be passed by HTTP. So basically, they were feeling lazy. They didn't want to create another transfer protocol for web services. So they just used a language that can already be understood by HTTP. Okay? So this means that any browser is able to use these web services. Right, that's why they're using XML um, to, to create the web services. And you can see it does look very similar to HTML. You, don't, you guys don't need to know too much detail about how XML works. You'll just need to know the basic structure. So you can see, um, I'll zoom in a little bit, if it allows me to. They've got like an envelope, a body. So they've also got a body here. There is also a head tag, but that's basically all you guys need to know about it. There's an envelope a head and a body, just like we have in HTML. Okay, and that's like the basic template of these XML requests. And this is just how we pass around communication between um, people, clients accessing the web services and the server that is hosting the web service. So this exact request is sent to the server hosting the web service and it responds. And the only thing that's different is that int, that int there is replaced by whatever integer you type in. And then you hit invoke and it responds with this thing. You see it's given in an int tag, an int tag, and it's, the, the response is 120, okay, which is five factorial. Um, so you could see if I put in six, I think it's seven, is it 720? Yeah, 720. Cool. All right, that's, that's actually that. I think let's take a very short break, like five minutes, and then we'll come back and actually learn the theory of web services. Sorry to do things in this order again, um, I, I really would prefer to do it in the normal order, um, but, but hopefully this, this works as well, okay. Um, so we'll come back, oh, that's the current time, so we won't come back instantaneously. Break over, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll do a weird time. We're coming back at 15.53, I'll start lecturing again. Just some time to get some water, uh, go to the bathroom, whatever. Okay, I'm gonna go grab a glass of water. I think actually when we come back, load shedding might have started for me. I was actually quite nervous for this lecture because of this whole load shedding thing. Because so many things could go wrong. Because like my Wi-Fi is currently running on a car battery. So if, if that comes loose from like the transformer, then my Wi-Fi is off. 
that would be bad. But then also I have to connect on two accounts. So like my laptop is recording the lecture, but I'm programming on my desktop. So much could go wrong. My laptop also has this weird thing sometimes that when you suddenly unplug it or like the power goes off, it'll just go into like the battery will go into like critical power failure or something and just switch off the laptop. Oh yeah. So by the way, when my power does cut, which will probably be in like eight minutes, if I just suddenly disconnect, you know why. Um, but hopefully my laptop is okay. Yeah, the other thing I wanted to show you guys is the how to use the view state variable, like the, the dictionary. So I've shown you guys how dictionaries work, but I did want to show you how to actually use them to manage the state. Um, but maybe we'll do that next week, just before you guys write the chapter chapter four test. Oh yeah, and by the way, next next week you guys are writing the chapter four test. <laughs> Easy way to break it to you. It's good though, it means we're finished with chapter four. So we, we're we well on track to finish before November. Which is nice because it means we'll have a lot of time to learn databases because that's, that's quite useful. Okay, let's get started again. So we're gonna start learning about web services. You guys know how to program web services now, but we're, it's time to learn about them. Um, you can't really learn about web services without learning about like web applications and stuff first. So the first thing we're going to talk about is IIS, which is just like a Windows thing. So IIS is a web server on Windows and it just hosts web applications. Okay, so the important things to, to note here. So number one, IIS stands for Internet Information Services. So remember that. Um, it's a web server for Windows. Okay, that's fairly straightforward. Like we, we know what these are. Um, the one thing that we might not know to the required level yet is web applications. So you guys know basically what web applications are, but now we want to discuss them in, in like slightly more detail. Okay. So we, we know what we have websites. Okay. So we have websites. What a site is, is a collection of web applications. Okay. Uh, so web applications. Web applications are applications that run on a web server and are accessible through a web browser. Okay, so what we've been creating currently, you could see as like web applications. A website is just a set of web applications. Okay. So just a bunch of different web applications that you can go through. Um, so for example, YouTube will have a web application for viewing the videos and they'll have a web application for like content creators uploading videos. And those are actually different web applications. They're on the website. So the site can point to these different web applications, but they are different web applications. Uh, the, a good way to show you guys the distinction. You can see here, I have solution lesson four, right? Solution lesson four. I have web application one, which was the web application we used to show the events in the page lifecycle. And I have web application two, which is the, um, web application that we use to show the web services. Okay, so you can see that the web applications are both a part of the same site, like this lesson for solution. Okay. Cool, so, so hopefully that makes sense. And then we have virtual directories. Okay, so what is a virtual directory? It's an alias or on, on Linux, they're usually called symbolic links that point to a physical real directory on the web server. 
So the best way I thought of to show you this, like when you guys, you know, when you up, um, when you guys, when we were creating those HTML documents, okay, we were creating those um, HTML documents with CSS and JavaScript and you opened them in your browser, right? It was sort of similar to how this looks, right? So I'm going to post this here. Um, you guys don't have access to this URL, so don't bother, don't bother accessing it because local, this port is only pointing to this page on my computer. It's not on the internet yet. Um, but the point is you can see it's going slash web service one dot AS, ASMX question mark OP equals factorial. By the way, that's a query string, right? Um, we, so what this is doing, it's pointing to like an actual like an actual um, document, you see this web service one dot ASMX, it's pointing to this actual file. That's what that's pointing to. But notice that it's go, it's accessing it through like localhost slash. Now, where is this web application actually? Like if I hit properties, so it's just opening up the file here. If I hit properties, I should be able to see somewhere where this is saved on my computer, hopefully. I mean, okay, maybe I can't see that information through. Uh, yeah, maybe I can't see that up information through Visual Studio. I haven't used it much, but let me just show you where this is on my computer. So it's saved on my desktop in a folder called Workspace, in another folder called Lesson 4, in another folder called Web Application 2, <coughs> in another, in a file called webservice.asmx. So the full path to this is, is this. That's the full path to that file that that local host is pointing to. Okay. Oh, well, and, and then obviously with the slash with the name afterwards. So let me just, I'll, I'll just do it, just do it fully. Um, so you can see that the full, the full path to the, this file is quite long. But notice that the browser isn't pointing to this. The browser isn't pointing directly to this file with the full path that it's saved on my computer. It's as accessing it through localhost slash that web service.asmx. And this idea of virtual directories, oh, why did I why did I open Windows Media Player? What the heck? Um, so it's it's pointing to and this is basically the idea of virtual directories. Another way I can show this to you is if I access like uh, another another website uh, again, because again, I'll just use this one because it's an example that I know, okay? So I'll say, I, I can open up a book, all right? Like Pride and Prejudice. You can see that this book is available at this URL, slash library slash, and then this crazy ID. Obviously, that's not the exact path to this book, to the file, like to the .epub that this book is rendering from. The exact path to this book is not that, right? The server does not have this book saved at that location. So what has happened is that the server created a symbolic link, a virtual directory, and that virtual, so if you access this, that directory, the computer sees it as an alias for where the book is actually saved on the server, okay? So what this allows you to do is not show your user the exact path to the file on the server, okay? That's the advantage of these virtual directories. Like this, um, edgeassess.co.za slash library, slash library doesn't exist on the server. There is no folder called library on the server. This is a totally symbolic link. Okay, so edgeassess.co.za slash library. There is no folder called library on the server. This is symbolically pointing to a set of files. Okay, and we call that a virtual directory. So a website is made up of web applications and virtual directories. Okay, cool. You can manage these websites, these applications, and these virtual directories through a tool. So if you're using IIS, which I mean, sure, if you, if you want to use IIS to make a website, that's, that's great. And if you, if you are, then you can manage sites, applications, and virtual directories through the IIS manager tool on Windows. And I'm telling you that because if they ask you, how do we manage web applications when using IIS, you must know that there's a thing called the IIS manager tool. Okay, this is like literally default installed on Windows machines. Like you can just go here and type IIS. You have to activate it. It's very easy to do. Um, but yeah, there's, there's an app called Internet Information Services IIS Manager, okay? 
so it exists. And if, you, if you're on a Windows machine, it will exist. Even if you can't find it there, you just have to activate it in like the add or remove program screen. Um, anyway, cool, so that's IIS, um, and that's what web applications and websites are. Okay. Cool, now we can move on to discussing web services. So formally speaking, web services are software components. Okay, so software components, services that can be accessed over a network, i.e. the web. Okay, so that's why they're called web services. I just obviously didn't want to use services and web inside the definition. Okay, so web services are software components that can be accessed over a network, and that network is Okay, load shedding just started, but luckily we planned for this. <laughs> um, let me just share my screen from here and open up the... Yeah, That's, it's all good though. I'm still connected and it's still recording and my laptop did not turn off. That's the main thing. So the plan has worked, guys. The only thing that remains that is left to be seen is whether or not my um, whether or not my internet, like the car battery powering the internet, doesn't like disconnect for some reason. Um, okay, going to head over to Google Drive and open up the lecture, and then just share my screen. Yeah, I told you today. Today, guys, the the actual lecture is is about disaster management. You guys thought it was about web services, but it's not really. It's about disaster management. <laughs> okay, but we can we can keep going. Now, this car battery thing is quite cool. It can power our Wi-Fi for like twelve hours if it doesn't disconnect. The problem is, you know, it's connected with those like black and red, the same ones you use to jumpstart a car. And those can come loose if someone like bumps them or something. Okay, anyway, where were we? So we just defined websites, that's great. Um, we were now learning about web services. Okay, so this formal definition of web services doesn't give you, you've seen what web services are now, so maybe you can connect this definition with what you just saw practically in your head. Um, but I didn't think, this definition is not great. So we're gonna discuss web services at a more abstract level. And again, ideally I would have shown you this before showing you how to actually program web services, but it didn't work out like that, okay. Anyway, so there's you, all right, that's you on the left, and you're going to Snitchel House, which is like a German restaurant. At this particular German restaurant, you'll have to take my word for it, you can see it says authentic German restaurant. It looks like they can probably speak English, but at this particular German restaurant, for the sake of example, they don't speak English. Okay, so you're going into this restaurant and you're looking to, to you know, make an order, you, you know, do what you do at restaurants. Um, so you say like nine drinks, please, and they say nicht was. Um, I don't know if this is actually funny in German, but I thought it was quite funny in English. Anyway, so the, the problem that we're running into here is the restaurant only speaks German and you speak English, probably. I don't know if any of you speak German. If you do, then that's cool. Um, anyway. So how do we solve this problem in the real world? Like if the chef, so there's a kitchen at the restaurant, right? And you wanna go directly to the chef and, and ask, him for, ask him for your food, but he doesn't speak English. He only speaks German because he's a German cook. Um, and so you can't ask him for your food in English. So how can you possibly communicate? How would a real restaurant solve this problem when you don't speak the same language as their cooks? Exactly, we need some kind of interpreter or translator, precisely. In the context of a restaurant, we would probably just call this person the waiter, right? So the waiter speaks both German and English, okay? Um, and so he can stand, he or she could be a waitress. In this case, we're working with the waiter here. And um, they, they can just stand in place and interpret for you, precisely, translate. And basically, if you replace all of these actors with computers, we've got the idea of what a web service is. Okay, so we, we have like a web server, that's the German cook who can speak only in C sharp. We've got you, who's just an innocent browser. You only know how to speak HTML and um, CSS and JavaScript, but you wanna use some of that C sharp functionality, right? You wanna get some of that C sharp functionality. 
and that's where web services come in. Okay, uh, yeah, Ethan, we would have jumped back a little bit in the textbook. This would be like under understanding web services. This is like 100, page 107, probably. Yeah, around there. Um, but I, I don't know, the, the explanation in the book isn't very long. It's like a single paragraph. Um, but this, this was better, I think. Um, but yeah, cool. It basically works like, like a restaurant. Okay, so like what a waiter is, that's what our web services do. Web service is doing. They're interpreting between the languages that the browser understands and the languages that the server understands. Okay, obviously there's more to it than that, and you've already seen some some of what we mean by there's more to it. Um, but we'll go into more detail now. Wait, what is the time? How much time do we have left? It is ten past five past four. Okay, cool. We will easily make it through this. Okay. So web services allow you to access the functionality of classes and methods on a remote computer without necessarily knowing the language they were created in. Now you can, it is possible for a web service to provide functionality that requires you to understand the language. It is possible. So like for example, a web service could give you back a C-sharp object, okay? And if it gives you back a C-sharp object, obviously you need to know how to speak C-sharp to understand the object. Um, but, but it's also possible for a web service to just return, you know, standard things that are intelligible to, to just a browser, like as we've seen. Um, but yeah, it is possible for them to return things because obviously web services can also facilitate communication between web servers. Um, right, they can also like the web service knows all the languages, so so it's able to still speak between web servers as well. But the standard use case is something like this. Um, cool. So web services and the message they pass and the messages they pass are defined in XML and transferred over HTTP. And we've already discussed a good reason for this, right? The reason we create web services in XML and trans is because XML can be transferred over HTTP. And the reason we want it to be transferred over HTTP is because basically every single web browser and every single web server in the world will understand HTTP. So this is compatible with literally everything. Your phone can use a web service, your laptop can use a web service, everything can use web services. Okay, um, I think it's worth just showing you guys where, where like a web service might be used. Um, a really good example that, that I actually saw um, is uh, like online actually is like if you're looking for a um what what we would like flight to cape town from jhb okay so you'll go to one of these sites let's see there'll be cheapflights.co.za so we can click this scroll down and you can see this is giving me so if i if i pick like dates or whatever yeah whatever search Okay, you can see that it's giving me a whole bunch of flights here, right? There are air link flights. Uh, let's scroll through some of these. There's fly sapphire. There's, um, okay, this one happens to only have air link and fly sapphire. I don't know if those are just the cheapest flights. For oh, wait, we're in coronavirus currently. I guess there aren't many flights happening. Okay, mango. Cool, so they've got like Fly Sapphire, Air Link, and Mango. Okay, and I imagine if we scroll down, we would see some other, um, some other airlines as well. Now, what's, what's, how is this doing this? Do you think, A, so there, there are a couple of ways we could do this, right? Either cheapflights.co.za has direct access to Air Links, Sapphires, and Mango's databases, and is able to query those databases directly. That's, it's, it's technically possible. Cheapflights.co.za would have to be a very powerful company in order to be able to have access to all of these different airlines' as servers. Um, and, but yeah, the more likely explanation is that Safair, Airline, and Mango have set up web services that allow cheapflights.co.za to query for what flights are available be between particular dates. Okay. And all cheapflights.co.za did was, and it's not, it's not, don't let me, I'm not trying to trivialize it. It's probably, it's quite difficult to do. Um, but what cheapflights.co.za did is queries those web services. Okay. It accesses those web services and gets the details from all of these different airlines. 
And if an airline hadn't set up that web, okay, cool, we're finally here at South African Airlines. If a, if a um, airline hadn't set up those services, then you would not be able to query for these flights. Okay, it would, you would not be able to access them. Um, but cool, so that's one popular use case for, uh, for web services. Other, other, there are many, okay, there are many. Like um, if, you, if you've ever seen one of those sites like an aggregator, um, like Twitter or whatever, you, they might save someone's, like you can access it and you'll be able to see everyone's tweets, right? Or, or like Instagram or whatever. It, it, they'll like aggregate everyone's accounts onto like a separate website that's not Instagram or not Twitter. Like what, how those are doing that is because Twitter and Instagram have released a web service. They don't actually have to query Twitter's database. There's just a web service that allows you to give the name of someone's account and Twitter gives you back their um, tweets in like a readable format. So you don't need direct access to Twitter's database. Okay. So there's lots of places where web services are used. So hopefully that gives you already some use cases, you know, now like call centers um, where, where we have a bunch of cheap machines that need to be able to run some complex functionality. To, to be able to help people answer questions or to record their phone or record the phone calls or like, you know, switch case statements to like move through troubleshooting, that kind of thing. We'd use it at a, at a call center. We would use it for like um, these cheap flights.co.za things. We would use it like Google Maps. If you, if you want to use Google Maps on your website, you don't need to own Google, right? You can, in, you can query Google Maps and Google Maps would give you back feedback. Like you give it an address and it will give you like a Google Maps location, right? So that's also a web service. Um, nowadays, they're more done with things called APIs, but all web services are APIs. So the, the reverse is not necessarily true. Not all APIs are web services, but all web services are APIs. But all you need to know is web services. If you don't, if you don't know what APIs are, don't even worry about it. Just ignore what I said. Anyway, so, so that's the, the basics of web services, done. Um, that's, that's, what they're, what, that's what they're for. There's now a couple of questions left, okay? Because um, you guys remember when we created an event, uh, I'll, I'll sh I think I'll explain it this way um, because it makes sense to me. Um, when we created events, we had to define the sort of structure of, of the events, if you guys recall. Um, so, we like there, there was a method, let's say, let's say the method we want to add to the event is like public int event subscriber and it expects int A, right? It's something like that. And I want to be able to say um, a, event handler plus equals event subscriber. You guys remember something, something along those lines. What I had to do was define this delegate, right? We needed a delegate that defined the structure of the event, right? Or the, the structure of the method that the events expect. So like the delegate would be something like public, delegates, int, events, handler, um, and it takes in int a. The delegate would maybe look something like that, okay? So you see it's, it, it, it gives back an int and it takes in an int exactly like our subscriber does. Okay. So the, de the delegate is literally just defining like the, the structure of a, bunch of, event, of, of, of a bunch of methods. So we need the same thing here. If, if that explanation doesn't quite gel with you, hopefully the next one will. The, the basic idea is when you wanna access this web server, this web service, okay, you wanna access this particular web service on a web server. Um, and, and the web service is defined as a standard c -sharp method, right? It takes in like an integer or a string and it gives back an integer or a string or, or like whatever data type, like in a, a list of integers, whatever. The, the issue that you run into is how do you know as, how do you, like you on the left here, how do you know what the web service expects and what it gives back to you? How do you know the structure of the web service without knowing the um, without knowing C sharp, like how do you know the structure of the web service without knowing C sharp? How do you know what variables it expects, and how do you know what it returns? 
So the answer to this is, is actually quite simple. It's a thing called WSDL, the Web Services Description Language. Okay? And this is basically what it is. Whenever a web server creates a web service, or whenever a company creates a web service that will be served on the internet, they release something called the WS, a WSDL. And for the little web services we created, C Sharp generated it for us automatically, which is great. So what is this WSDL? As, as the name suggests, it, w, it, it describes the web service, okay? Web services description language. It is used to describe the web service. So it's also XML based, which means it's also able to be transferred over HTTP. And you guys know why we want it to be transferred over HTTP. And in the description of a web service, we had mentioned things like the data types the web service expects you to give it, the methods the web service has access to. So remember the entire class that the, that the web method is in. So we, the entire class is marked as a web service with like those square brackets. It's marked as a web service. And the, the methods are marked as web methods, if you guys recall um, from our little discussion um, earlier. So there's like these square brackets, web service, web method. Okay, so the, the web service description language, it'll, we'll specify everything, every method that is available inside that class that is marked as a web service. And also all the data types that those methods expect and the URLs to access those methods. So you saw um, when we accessed the factorial um, web service, we went to slash factorial, and then we had a little query string specifying what number, um, like what we wanted to um, put in, like what, like which, which one we were accessing, okay? Like a query string. Um, hopefully uh, it'll be clear on, the, clear on the recording as well, in case you've forgotten. But, but like you can understand why this is necessary. Right, the, the, you need the WSDL because without it, anyone accessing your web service doesn't know the structure of the web service. Like how can you use something if you like don't know what it expects, what it gives back, um, where to find it. So all of these things are specified in the WSDL. And you can see a lot of examples. There's like automatic WSDL generators um, online. Like I uh, think you'd Google them. Yeah, WSDL generator. Yeah, there's, there's many of them, okay? The, so you, you can specify like the URL of a web service and they'll go ahead and generate the WSDL for it. What you guys need to know is the function of the WSDL. What is it doing? It is describing the web service so that clients are able to access the web service, right? It makes sense. And it makes sense why this is necessary, hopefully. Um, if it doesn't, then please do, do ask if, if you need anything more clarified. The other thing which we've actually already seen is how you actually access the web service. Because again, we run into the same problem. I mean, I can show you, I can show you, get, get you some intuition about the problem that we had run into. If I've defined this web service that we've just seen, like um, public int add numbers, something like that, and you give it int A and int B, and it just returns A plus B, and we mark it as a web method. Obviously, uh, Rex tester won't understand what this means because we haven't imported. We, we, we would need to say using system.web and you have to have everything set up, obviously, like all of those help, helper files. Um, but you can imagine it would look something like that. Um, so when we define this, so we now know how the user can get the structure, right? Using WSDL, we can explain to all of the potential clients what the where they can find this method what the method expects what the method returns and all of all of that kind of stuff we we know how to describe this using wsdl the other issue that we run into is how do you invoke the method without knowing c sharp because remember the client doesn't know c sharp so how can the client say add numbers 5 11 semicolon so this is c sharp right C sharp knows what this means. That means we're accessing the add numbers method. The first integer is five, the second integer is 11, and then there's a semicolon. There's two problems here. Number one, this add numbers 511, that can't be transferred over HTTP. Number two, it is C sharp, so a browser doesn't understand it. So you can't use this way of invoking the method. 
And so you need a different way of accessing the functionality of these web services. And what we use for that is called SOAP. Okay, SOAP, the Simple Object Access Protocol. And again, you guys have kind of seen the structure. I, I'm, I pointed it out when, when we were looking at the web services that we created earlier, um, like by example. Um, but basically, SOAP is the protocol that defines the structure and rules of message exchange for web services. I guess that's the, that's the other trouble, right? I, I, I explained half of the problem here. So half of the problem is that Number one, the client doesn't know how to structure a C-sharp method because it doesn't know C-sharp. The second problem is when your web server says return A plus B, right? When the web method says return A plus B, C-sharp knows what that means. So the web server knows what that means. It goes, okay, create an integer. In that integer, save the value A plus B and pass that back to the calling code. Okay. But if you just return that integer back to the user, to the client who doesn't know C sharp, you get the same problem again. That integer is a C sharp integer. It doesn't make any sense to the client. So how can you transfer that back? And it also can't be transferred over HTTP at all. So how can you transfer it? And so SOAP solves that problem. It handles the rules, the, the structure of the messages that are passed between clients accessing the web service and the web server responding to, to these clients. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, never mind. Cool. So SOAP, that's, that's what it does. The messages are in, in a specially formatted version of XML. So uh, it's just another markup language. And again, just like everything else, it's transferred over HTTP. And that's the important bit, guys. The fact that it's all transferred over HTTP means that literally every single device in the world that has a browser will be able to use the web service. It has huge amounts of compatibility. Okay. So what is the structure of a SOAP message? And again, you, you guys have seen it. it. It looks, it's like XML isn't pretty. Um, I, I suppose it's worth mentioning. So XML, just like HTML, the ML at the end stands for markup language. And the purpose of markup languages is that both computers and human beings can interpret them. So it's like a middle ground, okay? Like human beings can easily read markup language and computers can easily read markup language. And hopefully you guys have seen that when editing HTML. And XML is the same, like you, it's almost like reading English. It's, it's very trivial to read. But what we, the basic structure of an XML message is actually very similar to the structure of an HTML page, okay? We, the only difference is that we have an envelope, okay? So envelope is like the outside HTML tags, okay? So you, you guys know that outside HTML tags um, define like all the code inside it is going to be HTML. In this case, we just use a thing called an envelope because it's kind of like um, what SOAP is doing is descri um, describing a way that clients can write letters to servers and servers can write letters back to clients and letters are held in envelopes. So they're called an envelope in this case. Okay, so we've, we've got like this envelope and inside the envelope, we have a header, which is optional as you've seen. <clears throat> with the web services we created earlier, they didn't have a header, so it is optional. You can just specify some extra stuff for the server, like who's requesting the web service. So for example, if let's say um, SAF Air has this openly available web service where you can query what flights are available, but they don't want everyone to have access to it. In that case, they could say you have to specify your username and password in the header of the envelope of your simple object access protocol letter, okay, and or, or message. And so you have to specify your username and password in the header, and if they're correct, then we'll give you access to the web service. But if not, then, then we won't. Okay, so that's what the header might be used for. And, and it could be used for other things as well. Okay, and it also has a body. And the body you've seen, so, so the body is just gonna say which method you're accessing and pass it like what, what the method expects, okay? But in XML so that it can be transferred over HTTP. Right, and that is actually it. That's all you need to know about web services, okay? So what, what did we learn? You need to mark web services, the classes with the web service um, tag. You also need to mark methods that you wanna be available in that web service with the web method tag. So if, so let's say you have a class that's marked as web service and you have two methods in it, and you only want one to be accessible through the web service. 
then you only mark that one with web method. And the other one can just be like for, for some extra work that you don't want to be directly accessible. Okay, so that's why that distinction exists. You have to mark both the, the class as a web service and the methods you want accessible as web methods. Okay. Um, we also learned what WSDL is and what SOAP is. Um, the other thing that I explained at the beginning of the lecture with the, with the page lifecycle is that auto event wire up idea. Okay, do you remember that auto event wire up idea? The other thing you guys learned what a virtual directory is, and that's very important knowledge, guys. If you ever become web developers, virtual directories will come up a lot in whatever language you're using um, and in whatever cloud storage you're using. And yeah, you also learned what websites are like formally. Websites are a collection of web applications and virtual directories. Okay, and yeah, that's, that's actually it. That's it for chapter four, actually. There's, there's one more thing I wanna show you, one more example, um, but you should have the theoretical knowledge required now um, to get through the, the, like webs, the, the chapter four assessments. And we actually ended four minutes early, um, so that's cool. And my laptop battery looks like it's gonna make it through the whole video processing. And yeah, we'll call it there for today, guys. Thank you for coming. I know it was a bit of a disaster. I'm sorry about that, but you know, load shedding, had to make a plan. Um, hopefully next week is smoother and there's no stage three load shedding. Yeah, thank you, Alex. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Byron. Uh, cheers, guys. Uh, have a good, uh, have yeah, a good weekend. Thank yeah. you. You too, you too, Amal Cheers. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Cheers, everyone. Thank you for coming. And yeah, hopefully, hopefully next week smoother. Yeah, you too, Kiara. Um, cool. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.